Father in heaven, I give you permission to take my carnal nature by the throat and choke it into submission, that your glory will be my only business. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When God made Adam, he made Adam in his image. God's image is multifaceted. The man as the head of the home is part of God's image. Husband and wife having children is part of God's image. The ability to choose is a major part of God's image. The gift of choice is a part of God's image. And when God made Adam, God gave to Adam the gift of choice. But God himself exercises the gift of choice. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. God exercises choice. When Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebelled against the authority of Moses and Aaron, and God came down through Moses to settle the conflict, in verse 7, Moses said, And the man whom the Lord shall choose, even he shall be holy. God exercises choice. It is a gift upon which a price cannot be placed. And because we are made in God's image, he has enabled us, endowed us with the gift of choice. And so we read in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, what? Choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose life. Question for you. When God made Adam, did God give Adam a choice regarding his behavior? Yes or no? Yes. Eat of that, those trees, leave this solitary tree alone. That was choice. But, listen to me carefully. And follow closely. In order for Adam to exercise that choice, and our subject is Adam and his children, Adam had to have been alive. Because a dead person cannot choose. If that's clear, say amen. A dead person cannot choose. Let me modify my phraseology. A lifeless person cannot choose. When God made Adam, before he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Adam wasn't dead. He was lifeless because to be dead, you must first have been alive. Genesis 2 verse 7, the Bible says, let me pray again. Father, as I continue, please, Father, literally speak through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's one action. There he was. Everything necessary for a happy life physically had been made. The eyes, the toenails, the teeth, everything made, but he was lifeless. In that condition, now God always intended to present Adam with a choice. You see, immortality is granted to those who choose it in the sense that they obey God's conditions and God blesses them with immortality. Immortality must be chosen by those who are tested. The angels in heaven were on probation. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, paragraph 1. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden had been placed upon probation. Their happy estate could be retained only on condition of fidelity to the Creator's law. They could obey and live or disobey and perish. They had to choose. Adam had to choose. But before Adam exercised the choice that God already intended to present to him, Adam had to be made alive. Because a dead person cannot choose. Now listen to me carefully. 
When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, answer this question very carefully, was Adam immortal, yes or no? No. Always speak with confidence even when you're wrong. Are you with me? When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, was he immortal, yes or no? No, he wasn't. Could he have chosen immortality? Yes. Before they could be made eternally secure, their loyalty had to be tested. Daughters of God, page 19, paragraph 3. Before being made eternally secure, what does that mean? Could no longer die, immortal. Their loyalty had to be tested. When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Adam was not immortal, but he was in a position to choose immortality by choosing obedience. If that's clear, say amen. amen. All right. And so God gave Adam life, and with that life, Adam can choose. If he had chosen to obey, he would have been made eternally secure. Is that clear? What's our subject? You're too slow. What's our subject? Adam and his family. Let's take a look at Adam again before we get to his family. Let's go to Genesis 3. It's two minutes after eight. I'll let you go as soon as I can. <laughs> we have Genesis chapter 3. Do you have that? If it's your culture not to answer the preacher, please break your culture tonight. So when I ask you if you have it, say yes or no. All right? Let's read from verse 1. When you found it, say amen. amen. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, He shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the sight, and to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now we have not sinless people, we have two sinners. Let's examine how sinners behave, not simply in the presence of God, but at just the mere sound of God. What we're about to read is the natural behavior of a sinner regarding God. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Stop. No sinner seeks God. Eloise says, when you preach, pause. So I have paused. No sinner, let me define sinner, an unregenerate, someone living in the flesh, seeks God. It is contrary to his genetic makeup. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can the leopard change his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil, a sinner not only does not seek God, what I'm about to say, a sinner cannot seek God. Listen to Paul, Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 10. Our subject, Adam and his family. As it is written, there is none righteous. What are the next few words? No, not one. From fallen Adam to this day, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that, look at verse 11, 
understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. I have to say it again. The unregenerate person does not see God and cannot seek God, and we see the early expressions of that behavior in the conduct of Adam and Eve, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. Your son may say, I heard your invitation to come to Christ or to come to church. I heard the invitation to join a Bible study group. I heard whatever. I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. As you reflect on that, you may begin to realize why it would be cruel of God to admit a sinner to heaven. It would be torture because sinners do everything except seek the presence of God. Now, sinners may seek church because the church is a social organization and social organizations provide certain benefits which are achievable without God. Am I getting through to you? A church organization, as a social organization, provides benefits that do not require the presence of God. And so there are multiplied millions who seek church. When Christ fed the 5,000, the only miracle I believe recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they followed him over the lake. They said, Master, when camest thou hither? He said, he seek me not because he saw the miracle, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. People, some people seek church for what church can do for them. That's not the same thing as seeking God. You see, to seek God is to seek holiness. It's to seek a person who loves and gets angry and is long-suffering and is patient and who forgives, to seek God is to seek a person and to have a relationship with that person. Even if you were the only person alive on the face of the earth, you have a relationship with God. You have sought God, but the sinner cannot seek God. We read, there's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. Go with me now to 1 Corinthians 2. We'll read verse 14. Our subject, Adam and his family. If I go too quickly, simply say, slow down. I'll be very grateful to you because I am genetically predisposed to going quickly. So on that point, I need conversion. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, continue to pour out your spirit, not for my sake, dear God, but for the sake of your glory and the blessing of your beloved people, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. But a carnal man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? They are spiritually discerned. That's the unconverted person. That's where we're born. The carnal man, the natural man, the carnal man receiveth not, will not accept, the things of the Spirit of God, but the things of the Spirit of God are the things of Christ. When Christ prayed, he said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless now. Christ said, I'll send the Spirit now. Here's what he also says about the Spirit. He shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. The gifts of the Spirit are the gifts of Christ entrusted to the Spirit to be given to the church. 
On the day of Pentecost, what we saw was the Spirit bringing the gifts from Christ. But they call the gifts of the Spirit because He administers them. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. In other words, the things of God. For their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. That's why Paul says, there's none that understandeth. Which puts the carnal man in an impossible situation. He cannot choose. I'll tell you why. Well, let the Bible tell you why. Let us go to Ephesians 2. We've discovered Adam was made alive by God. In that living state, he could choose obedience and disobedience. But when he was made alive, he was not immortal. He had to choose it, and he chose against it. But because he, of course, repented, he will receive that immortality when Christ comes back. We're looking at Adam's children now. We saw that Adam fled from God. He and his wife, they ran. That's the natural behavior of a sinner. Avoid God, not seek God. And then we discovered that there's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. Do you have Ephesians 2? Let's read carefully. And you hath he what? Come on, you hath he what? Quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, what does quicken mean? Look at the word dead, tell me what quicken means. To make alive. Now listen to me carefully. Now listen to the Bible. In what condition were those people when God quickened them? They were dead. Dead how? Spiritually. Listen to me again. They were dead. Mm -hmm. I just want to hammer home the word dead. Do you got dead? Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the two fundamental errors in the world among many are, one, the sacredness of Sunday, and two, what's the second one? The immortality of the soul. We teach from the Bible that the dead know nothing. This applies physically, read my mind and finish my thoughts, and spiritually. The dead, come on, talk to me, know nothing. Now listen to Paul. Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead. The only dead person who raised himself was Christ. Every other dead person had to be raised, finish my words, by somebody else. Only the people in the front are answering me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Let me say it again. All people beside Christ had to be resurrected by someone else. You have he quickened who were dead. Which means God has to do something for the sinner before the sinner can choose Jesus. He has to make him alive. Because a dead person cannot choose. You're looking at me as if I need medication. <laughs> Can a dead person choose yes or no? no? He has to be made alive. When Adam was made but lifeless, could he choose? No. God made him alive, then he could choose. And physical creation teaches us spiritual lessons because salvation is spiritual creation. And so Paul writes, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Why did death come into the world? Give me one word. Give me the long version of sin. Disobedience. Now, if you're a child of disobedience, you're a child of what? Death. Am I talking to myself? If you're a child of disobedience, you're a child of death. And were by nature, by the very lifestyle, they were dead. We know from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 
among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And chapter 5, they call children of disobedience. But the wrath of God is only poured out on the disobedient. But go to verse 4. But God, come on, who is rich in mercy, Keep reading. Now read microscopically. For his great love wherewith he loved us. Read with me now out loud if you have the King James Version. Even when we were what? Dead in what? Sin. Stop. <laughs> Not when we were baptized. Or when we were vegetarians. When we were dead in sin. Keep reading. Hath quickened us together with Christ. Now, the only person who can quicken the person dead in sin is Christ. The resurrection of Christ is a foundation upon which the person dead in sin can be quickened. That, that person may then choose life. You see, if God has quickened you, you have not yet chosen life. I lost you. I lost you. It's my fault. Let me try again by asking you this. Did Adam ask God to make him? No. He opened his eyes and he was made. The sinner cannot ask God to make him or her alive. God has to act proactively. Well, I know what my problem is. I'm talking too much. Let the Bible talk. Let's go to verse 4 and continue on. Read microscopically. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were what? Dead in sin, have quickness together with Christ. That's one action. Now, what's the other action? And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, for that to happen, the person quickened must choose Jesus. A dead person cannot choose God. And I feel convicted to say it 250 times. Because some of you, I suspect, are not following me. Let's stay in Ephesians. Go to chapter 5. Paul, let's read from verse 3. It's 20, 26 after 8 already. <laughs> okay. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no homonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. How many sins are listed from verse 3 to 5? How many are listed from verse 3 to 5? Count. Don't look at me. Look at the Bible. Tell me how many. You haven't got all night. How many sins do you see? Six. Give that man some glasses. How many do you see? Huh? Ten. God bless that sister. Ten. Nice sister. God bless you. Ten. Now. We, let, let, let's, let's go to verse 6. Let no man deceive you with what? Vain words. For because of these things, what are these things? The sins listed in 3 to 5 cometh the wrath of God upon whom? Yes, they're called the children of wrath in verse 3 of chapter 2, children of disobedience in verse 6 of chapter 5. Now, what does God say to those children of disobedience? Let's go to verse 14. Read with me. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, come on, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Look at that verse again. Two things. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Having been quickened from the spiritual death, then Christ can give life to those who choose it. Let me say it again. 
a dead person cannot choose God. And someone unregenerate is dead. God has to quicken that person. And that quickening power is Jesus Christ who gave his life that you and I might have life. Even when we were dead in sin, the life of Christ operates to quicken that person. When the person opens his eyes, having been quickened, the person realizes someone is searching for me. That's God. That invitation to come to church, that's God. That sermon I heard while I was looking for ESPN, that's God. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's God. I was looking for, you know, that magazine I bumped into while I was looking for Sports Illustrated, that's God seeking me. Are you with me? But you have to be alive to make that kind of conclusion. What's our subject? Adam. When God made Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Adam became a living soul. In that living condition, he could choose obey or disobey. He sinned. God had to come again to quicken him, to draw him to God, that he may choose again life or death. Jesus makes it very clear. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, what does it say? Draw him. A dead person cannot come to God. There's a prostitute in some street in some big city or some small city. In our eyes, she's dead to sin. Christ is quickening her. Are you with me? That she might come to him, her brother, in his humanity, her God, in his divinity. There's a drug addict in his fifth rehabilitation program, and Christ is quickening him that he may realize there's a power that can deliver him. Adam and his family. Adam had to choose. He chose catastrophically. But to choose, he had to be alive. Because of sin, the leopard cannot change his spots. The Ethiopian cannot change his skin. Therefore, God has to do something first. And since a dead man or a dead woman cannot choose Christ, Christ who describes himself as the life, he has to quicken that person. While the person is dead in sin, Ephesians 2 verse 4. He quickens them. Having quickened them, and the faculties can appreciate that someone is searching for them. Under the prodding of the Holy Spirit, that person may decide to respond to the fact that he has given me life. Now let me return my life to him. Choice. But to exercise choice, we have to be alive. God told Nicodemus, John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, But a natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned or spiritually seen. To see it, you've got to be quickened by Christ. Then you can decide to choose it. And so in verse 3, Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot see. It makes no sense. He cannot understand it. Now in verse 5, he says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter. You've got to see it before you make a decision to enter. This is not false doctrine. This is simple Bible teaching. No one of his own free will can come to God because the sinner is genetically programmed to avoid God. 
In that sense, the sinner has no free will because he does not have the freedom of will to choose God unless Jesus Christ quickens the mind. Then, with the intervention of Christ, that sinner can choose. And so Ellen White writes, um, Steps of Christ, page 17, I believe, paragraph 1, referring to Adam and to us. He was made captive of Satan and would have remained so forever had not God specially interposed. God had to step in when Adam fell. He had to step in because Adam could not step out. Adam and his family. The Bible says all our righteousness, come on, finish it. Faith you right. Is that before we converted or after? On both sides. <laughs> Even when you're converted, your righteousness is filthy rags. Because only the righteousness of Christ can save us. Did I offend your righteousness? Our righteousness is filthy rags even after we are converted. I said our righteousness, not Christ's righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ that saves us. Ours have no saving value because they're described by Christ as, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. And so tonight, as I address Adam's children, and they're in the pew and in the pulpit, can we not appreciate God for quickening us that we may choose Jesus. If he hadn't done that, no human being descended from sinful Adam could ever choose Christ. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. Let me ask you this. When did Christ quicken the woman at the well? Before she got rid of the man she was with or after? Before. He couldn't do it after because she would have had no incentive to do it. He had to quicken her first. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus from the grave to the right side of God. Raised from spiritual death, given a choice, we choose Christ, elevated to the right hand of God in Jesus Christ. How many of you will say with me, Father, thank you for this great truth. Can I see your right hand? This great, stand up with me. We ought to pause and think of how sweet God is, how lovely he is, how generous, how unselfish, always thinking about what's best for us. Having heard what you heard tonight, Adam and his children, who will say genuinely, Father, I, Recommit my life to you. May I see your hand? If it doesn't cause pain, leave your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, a God, the only name whereby we must be saved, in his name, the name that is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it and are safe. In the name of Jesus, the one who said, let there be light, the one who said, Lazarus, come forth. In the name of the one who conquered death, hell, sin, the grave, and Satan, in his name. Thank you for your love, your goodness. Thank you, Father, through Christ. You quickened us when we were dead in sin that we may be able to choose life. Dear God, bless every upraised hand. Bless those whose hands are raised in their hearts. Let us meditate on what we've heard. Let our love for you increase. Grow higher and deeper, wider and denser. Father, may we love you even unto death. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you.
Have a good night. Keep these words on your mind. Our High Calling, page 116, paragraph 2. Your last thought at night, your first thought in the morning, should be of Him in whom is centered your hope of eternal life. God bless you.